Want to know how the pros make the shows that you stream? Well, you're in the right place. It's your Hollywood dream with Cynthia Shung. How do you become a writer for television? A lot of people dream of writing for television. Most of us grow up watching some kind of television, whether it be on streaming or on broadcast network television, or maybe I'm sure we've all gone to the movies because these days movies and television seem quite seamless. Whatever might be on the big screen today is likely on the small screen tomorrow. So if you've ever watched a lot of shows growing up and thought, gee, I can write those, I know exactly what makes a good story. So how do you begin? One of the things to think about is if you live in Los Angeles or if you live somewhere else, do I need to live in Hollywood? The answer is maybe. Initially, you don't have to. Initially, you can study the craft of writing from wherever you are, and that doesn't even have to be within the United States. You could be in another country. I have students that are from all over the place. I've had students in Taiwan, in Singapore, in Germany, in Austria, in France, in Canada, India, Japan, Mexico, Panama, Ecuador. Gosh, where else have I had students really from all over the place? So when you first begin thinking about writing for television, the first thing you might want to think about is watch television, but watch it very analytically. Usually we grow up watching television like a fan. We sit back, we enjoy it, we relate to the characters, we love the scenery, we love the locations. It's always such an adventure to take when we're watching our favorite television series. If you are considering a career in writing for television, then the first thing you might want to do is to no longer just sit back and watch, but actually sit forward and really watch. But now watch it from the standpoint of how is this episode put together? Think about it in terms of when a storyline is introduced, and it may not always be that clear from the, they're not gonna put a sign that says, here's where the story begins. So you'll have to start to recognize when does the story begin? Start recognizing these key moments that come into being that make it so that you stay peeled to your screen and you can't take your eyes off of what's going on. So usually story begins, and then there's some sense of, peril being introduced, like, oh gosh, something's going to happen if, and whatever that if is, usually puts your main character into action. And then once you see what the risks are, what the peril is, the stakes, then you realize, gosh, my character or the, or the main character has to go through this situation because the stakes are really high. Then they'll be going through a series of events to likely try to avoid the consequence of what's been set up. So if the main character doesn't go into action because these stakes are high, then there's going to be some kind of consequence. So that main character has to keep doing whatever they're doing to try to avoid that consequence, to try to resolve the peril, to try to resolve the stakes. There will be things called story reveals along the way. So information that that the main character didn't know in the beginning, they will be showing themselves as the story progresses. Those are called reveals. Those reveals may actually make the stakes even higher. It might make the situation worse for the main character. And so the main character may have additional obstacles being piled upon them. And then the stakes usually are raised yet again Right when you think that it's safe and the coast is clear and you can breathe easy, there's going to be yet another set of stakes, which makes it so your main character has to go through even more than you originally might have thought. And what usually happens in that Hollywood way is it all works out in the end where the main character comes out the hero or heroine. They have they have overcome the obstacles. They have solved the situation that began the whole story to begin with. And they've made it so that they've avoided the consequences and they have resolved all of the different issues that began from the original struggle. And not only that, they usually come out with something else. So they usually come out ahead in some way. So that's kind of what you'll want to start to recognize as you're watching a television episode or television series. Start recognizing these key moments that come into being that make it so that you stay peeled to your screen and you can't take your eyes off of what's going on. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, now start to think of how that would play out in a written format. For television, we're talking a screenplay. No matter 
where you are or where you live, it's likely you're used to reading things like novels. Novels are self-contained stories. They are not something that then you will have to watch on a screen. Now, some novels, of course, do become movies or become television series, but I'm not talking about that at the moment. I'm talking about purely the vehicle of a novel. A novel has a self-contained story and it can give you as much uh, vivid uh, explanation. It can tell you what's going on in your main character's head at any given time. P they provide everything you need to know right there on the page. Not so with the screenplay. A screenplay is less of a, a vehicle of words, uh, even though it might seem like, well, wait a second, a screenplay looks like it's got a bunch of words on it. Yes, it does. But the words are placed in a way, it's the intermediary design tool that then allows a whole huge production to actually put the whole thing together in a visual medium. So the screenplay really acts more as a blueprint versus an actual finished product. It is not meant to stand on its own. And that's why you can't go to a bookstore or a regular library and just take out a screenplay and read it for the weekend. I mean, you can find them, they are online, but it's not the vehicle that most people would pleasure read. So the fine art of learning how to write the screenplay comes into it all. So there are a couple of things I would advise the beginner to do if you are thinking of taking this journey of becoming a television writer. I would suggest you read a book that's written by someone who is quite accomplished and that can give you a real down to earth portrayal of how they began their career in Hollywood. And there are a couple of suggestions I can make. There's one written by a friend and colleague of mine called Swords, Starships, and Superheroes, written by the very accomplished television writer, Paul Robert Coyle. Paul is a fantastic screenplay writer. He was one of the writers for Star Trek, as well as Hercules and Xena. And he even wrote an episode where young Hercules appeared on Hercules. And for those of you that may know, Young Hercules was my show. Paul Robert Coyle and I go way back. Another book that's useful is this book called Inside the Room. It's a collection of different chapters written by television writers. It's very useful for a writer to get a professional portrayal of what it's like inside the writer's room, what can help you in your career, and what can help you get to where you ultimately would like to be, which is to write television. So for example, here's one section two says, writing your half hour television comedy specs and pilots. And uh, I do have a video on the difference between specs and pilots. It's not one of my better videos, but if you just wanna know what the differences are, you can check that one out in my video list. And I'll put the link down below. And the nice thing about it is, you get the voice of many different television writers um, putting their voices together to give a realistic portrayal of what a television career could be like. One that I really like is The Hero Succeeds by Cam Miller. The Hero Succeeds really goes into a lot of character development and things that really are about television characters in particular and how to make them the, the memorable icons that we learn and grow up with and love for years and years, decades, and even a lifetime. So Cam Miller's The Hero Succeeds is a good one. Now, if you have aspirations to be a showrunner, so a showrunner is the person who generally creates a series, but not just that, they are really the person whose creative vision stays with the series as it's in production, as it's in post-production, all the different stages of a television series, that show runner's vision is the predominant vision that oversees the entire series. Uh, I used to say this very quietly because director friends of mine used to get annoyed when I said, directors are to film what show run runners are to television. Now I've been saying that for a long time. So directors are to film what show runners are to television. I had a few director friends get mad at me. And by the way, I'm a director too. I've directed a couple of feature films. So, I wasn't saying it lightly. I was saying it from a place of who's the person that everyone goes to to ask, what is your vision of this? What is your vision of this? That's the director for film and it is the showrunner for television. And I've been in both spots. I've been a showrunner, I've been a director, and I can tell you that it does work a little differently. Anyway, so I got a little flack for that years ago, but you know what? People are saying it now 
all the time. In fact, even those same director friends of mine who used to give me trouble are saying it now. Okay. This is an excellent book. If you can find it, I believe it's still available on Kindle. It may be out of print though. This is an excellent book on the uh, production side of things for television. It's written by a colleague, Robert DelVal. Robert DelVal's credits include everything from, he's doing the prequel to the Yellowstone now. Um, and he's done Westworld, he's done Six Feet Under, The Sopranos. He even goes back to 90210 and Melrose Place. His credits go on and on. He's an amazing, fabulous UPM um, producer. And he is, uh, this book is such a great resource. It is unfortunately out of print, but you know, people always ask me, how come there isn't something more up to date? Or I'll tell you because professionals who are really the people you want to work from are too busy. They're so good that they're constantly working. So um, if it is a little bit older, it definitely still applies. They haven't changed production that much. Tech Technology might have come in, changed cameras and certain ways of shooting things. COVID has changed some things. But the backbone of how productions work still is the same today and uh, as it was when Bob wrote this. So this is still an incredibly relevant book. Okay, so let's say you really want to write a screenplay. How do you even begin? Well, the first important thing is to get your hands on as many screenplays as you can. I always tell my students the same thing. And I have to tell you, I'm not so sure that they all listen because I always wonder why are they not doing this? It is really quite simple. It's exactly what I did when I was young. It's exactly what so many friends of mine, colleagues of mine, incredibly successful Oscar Emmy winning colleagues who, who we all started out as fans of television shows and movies, and we all became professionals. We all did the same thing. You basically take some television series that you love. If you are into film, you do the same with film, but let's just focus on TV. Take a television series that you love. And then nowadays you can just Google it, look for, look under the name of it, write pilot and write PDF. There's a high likelihood you'll find it. So if I go right now and I Google Game of Thrones pilot PDF, And I am doing this without knowing at all if it exists. I just got it. <laughs> okay. So I just did that without knowing if it existed. And sure enough, it has come up. It doesn't have a title page, but there it is. So all I did, you can look up here in the subject matter. I had Googled in there. Here's what I Googled. I Googled Game of Thrones pilot PDF. And I clicked over here because it looked like the easiest way to get there. The first thing I would suggest you do is you find the screenplay, you read it just by itself. So I would let the words activate the visual imagination in your mind. Try to watch it while you're reading it without it being anywhere near you on a screen. You're just reading the screenplay. You're envisioning it in your mind. Next step, put the screenplay down watch the actual episode that you just read, okay? Third step, I would watch the episode and have the screenplay open at the same time and follow along side by side. Even if you need to print out the screenplay and then watch it, that's okay too. And that actually might work better because you might be able to scribble on some notes and then study it. Study why the screenplay is written the way it is. I bet you all of the visuals that you see on the screen are not going to be written on the page, on the screenplay. What will be the real focus and concentration in the script will be the story points. So that's when you start to look at the screenplay as a collection of story beats. And story beats uh, is a whole nother subject matter. I do have videos on story beats. There's actually one where I go through an exercise of a reverse engineered story beat for Emily in Paris. That's an easy one to follow. If you don't like Emily in Paris, it's not about liking it at this point. It's really about learning from it and learning what a story point and a story beat is. So check out that video as well. How do you actually start your own screenplay? In television, we map out several different 
parts to before we actually start writing the screenplay. We have some other videos on, on that, which have to do with act break structures. So in television, you'll start to notice there's a particular format. How do you recognize that? After you watch enough television, I guarantee you, you'll start to notice that there are the these planned areas where you take a bit of a break mentally. Now, some stories can go on and on and on, but there are generally built-in breakpoints. These are called acts and act breaks. And to get used to that, that's when you're going to get a little bit deeper into what makes for an act one, an act two, and act three. Generally, all stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end, which is an act one, an act two, and an act three. And you guessed it, I do have other videos on that. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into it here. Now let's say you're at a point where you are ready to tackle your first screenplay. What do you do? How do you write that? How do you know what and how to format it? All right, now you might need a tool, something like this, okay? This book is by Christopher Riley. It's the Hollywood Standard. So we'll go into just things like, what's the balance between the, the dialogue and the visual descriptors? And um, I can tell you from having read screenplays for decade upon decade upon decade, I can look at a screenplay visually and immediately get a sense of how advanced or how amateur this writer likely is. Likely. I'm not going to say I know everything, not for not even for a second, but I will immediately get a sense of that from visually looking at it and looking at the balance between the written visual description areas versus the dialogue areas and the slug lines and the attention to uh, the act break structure. Just keep that in mind. There is an engineering science to a screenplay. The pages translate, for example, one page of a screenplay translates into one minute on the screen, generally speaking. So there is a direct correlation between the balance and how the screenplay is formatted and then how it translates onto a screen. It's definitely something you don't want to ignore and you definitely want to put a certain amount of concerted study into that. So keep in mind again that the screenplay is a blueprint. It's a blueprint that once it leaves your hands, it goes into a sea of usually thousands of people who will be putting that piece together. And your screenplay is what they will be using as a blueprint. All right, so now, do you need to move to Los Angeles to get your career off the ground? So in the beginning, you don't necessarily have to move to Los Angeles if you're in study mode. You can study without being in LA. I will tell you the advantages though to being in Hollywood. The advantages are that you are in the thick of it. You don't just have to study it in a vacuum. You go out to a coffee shop. It's Chances are the people right next to you are talking about things that you might be thinking of. So you can start a conversation and learn from people who are just around you all the time. You can get a job or a part-time job as you're studying. People you'll very likely meet when you're working are going to also be involved and interested in the same thing. You can get valuable experience working on a television production, or maybe you go straight to working for a production company where you are an assistant for the writers or whatever it might be. There is a more instant way of it's totally merge in. I equate it to if you're learning a foreign language, if you're learning a foreign language, sitting at home, listening to Rosetta Stone or watching YouTube videos, you may learn a few words, but then you push yourself out there and you go to a country that speaks that language. All of a sudden you have to speak it. Similarly, if you are in Los Angeles learning about television, then it's a total immersion because just about everyone out here in Los Angeles has something to do with the television or film industry. Once though you are really serious about getting a career in television, then I would absolutely say it likely is time to look at moving to Los Angeles. So many people say, but I need a job first. I can't move until I have a job. Most people don't hire people unless they are living locally already. The reality is you likely would not be their first choice. So I would seriously consider saving some money and trying to make the move 
And even if it meant you had to temp for a while, maybe you do some editing on the side, you can certainly hire yourself out. Having another way of making an income is a smart move in the entertainment industry because most things out here, even very successful people are technically freelancers. Everyone always has to look out for what their next job might be. So managing your money is very important when you think about a career in television. Having another skill set that could bring in some money when things are tight or when jobs are scarce, that's always a really smart move. I hope you've enjoyed this beginner's guide. Keep writing, keep being creative. I'll see you in the next video.